Let us pray. God of mercy, we thank you for this spirit of worship. We thank you for the reassurance of victory. We thank you for the reminder of your might and strength. We know that no weapon formed against us will prosper. We know that you created everything out of nothing. So the little problem that we're dealing with is well within your capability to eradicate. So thank you, Jesus. So today we just pray that we're reminded of all of your bountiful blessings as we share in this word today. Bless us in Jesus name we pray. Let us say amen. amen. Bless God one more time. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for your attentiveness. Thank you for your worship engagement this morning. From the 20th chapter of Exodus, verse 17, hear these words. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his manservant or maidservant or ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. I want to remind you today that there's green grass on your side too. There's green grass on your side too. In this culture, today we are inundated with suggestive messages say we must have more. We must have newer, we must have something we don't already have. This attitude is the foundation of the vast amount of dissatisfaction people have, even though we live in this great country of plenty. We feel pressure and we're constantly challenged by society to keep an eye on our neighbor. Keep an eye on what they're driving and where they're living. Watch out for those improvements that they're making. Keep an eye on where they work and what they do for a living. We're pressured to keep up or somehow we'll be left out or left behind. American citizens, although they have plenty, are some of the most dissatisfied people on earth. Our whole prosperity is built on encouraging greed and need to get something we don't already have that we don't need. But we got to have it. Advertisers are always sending messages. You won't be happy until you have our product. You haven't lived until you've experienced one of these. As Christians, we really need to evaluate our sense of happiness. What is it based on? What's the motivation behind this Acquiring things in our life. You know, here I am, naively thinking that I had everything I needed. I thought my life was happy. I thought my life was great. I'm doing it. Then I started feeling some kind of way when the advertisers started to talk to me. Because, see, I thought what I drive was cool. Then they told me the rules have changed because you don't drive the ultimate driving machine. <laughs> then I got a sad face because I thought I kept up with my oral hygiene pretty good. And commercial said that my teeth aren't even close to being as clean as they need to because I don't use this toothbrush. And I had no class at all because I just used regular yellow mustard. <laughs> oh, 
I want you to understand that we live in a world under a particular economic system that intentionally invokes us with a desire for more. That is the first key to suppressing and defeating a covetous spirit. Knowing that the stakes are against us. Mm. Commercials and advertisements, we are barraged with daily, minute by minute. They're designed to make us bored. I would go so far as to say even ashamed of what we have. And they awaken an insatiable desire in us to crave for something new and better. Again, get this, whether it's really new, improved, or better, is beside the point. They say you got to have these things, these particular things, are you, or, or you are nobody. And everybody wants to be somebody, right? So we feed into this endless cycle of more and different and better. Our society breeds this, this, this covetous spirit and, and prayerfully through this sermon will be enlightened to see that there's green grass on our side of the fence too. We just ain't been looking at it. You know, we all want peace. But those who covet Never find peace for they're always longing for something they don't have. And they spend the majority of their time looking at what they don't have. Thus, constant reality of unrest, no peace, no satisfaction. But those who are at peace focus on what they have or what they've been given. You see, we can either go through life craving more and more. Or we can learn to be content with what God has given us and allow God to give the increase and increase our territory. <laughs> Let us pause for a moment to say that territorial increase is based on our faith. I say again, don't pray for the Mercedes if you only have Metrolink faith. An attitude of discontentment is a heart condition. That's what this Ten Commandment deals with, a condition of the heart. All that we have, all that we are, come from the hand of God. With the blessing God pours so richly out of heaven on us, God calls us to be content. We want to sing the song, Satisfied with Jesus. Let me be clear this morning. Desiring things is not necessarily bad, but when our wants arise purely from the dissatisfaction of what God has given us, an envy of the way he's blessed others, it's a violation of the 10th commandment. Hmm. The, 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 little, the literal meaning of the word Covet is to pant after like a dog. It, it indicates an intense desire that will, will not leave. Usually it, it becomes consuming. Have you ever wanted something so bad you dreamed about it? You couldn't even focus at work. I got to get to the store. Somebody may buy my size. Let me be clear this morning. Coveting is not something just just happens to the poor. Doesn't matter how much money you have. It's, it's, it's not a poor condition. It's a human condition. Mm. That's the nature of coveting. It's, it's never satisfied. It's the basis for breaking the other commandments that we've discussed for the last nine weeks. As we dissect this commandment, we'll begin to see why God uh, forbids coveting 
from his children. You know, God forbids coveting because it sets our heart on things on earth rather than things in heaven. We, 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 we feel we have to have as big a house, as nice a house as the Joneses. Boy, if my spouse looked like my neighbor's spouse. I'd have a maid around here. We're so focused on the green grass of our neighbor's lawn that we know, ignore our own lawn and begins to look brown and withered. But it's not dead. It's just unkept. Unattended. Ignored. I have come to tell you this morning that Think about uh, the time it takes your neighbor. Think about the care they put into making their grass look like that. I would go so far to say that. Think about have you ever put that kind of time into your own grass? You say, God, if I had a lawn like that. Fertilize it every day. Water it, trim it. Oh, if I had a lawn like that. Our grass still brown. But boy, if I get that lawn. We can tend to get so caught up in the, the neighbor's spouse. That we lose sight of the spouse God has blessed us with. We're so blinded that we don't realize the same amount of time and care that uh, if we put it in our grass, it would be green and thriving too. The commandment goes on to say that we shouldn't covet our neighbor's ox or a donkey. You know, see, in Moses' day, an, an ox um, was a, burst of, a, a beast of burden, essential to make a living. Animals were a source of income. Without them, they couldn't bring in a crop. What the scripture is saying to us that we should not covet another man's job or the income. Get your hand out of my pocket. <laughs> See, it's not enough that God has provided us with a job. We want to be a boss like our neighbor. We want to be in charge. Beloved, start with trying to manage your own life. If we do that, God is going to give you the desires of your heart. Side note here. Just because you're good at something. Doesn't, need, doesn't mean you need to start a business doing it. I just got to say that because... Lord have mercy, Jesus. Um, these are two separate things. Okay. Just because you love kids and you're good with kids doesn't mean you need a daycare. Okay. okay. Just because you can push a mop and do wonders with a broom does not mean you need a janitorial business. You see, I'm not discouraging entrepreneurship, but before we make that step, ask God about it first, then get some education about business. If you mop that floor and you can't even put together a bill, how are you going to get paid? I just, I just felt that would help somebody. Maybe that's just for me. I just been dealing with some things and some contractors of late. <laughs> Glory. God closes the verses with the catch all and just says anything your neighbor has that covers it all. 
leaves us to investigate ourselves and our own desires. People turn to their neighbor, coveting their ability, their clothes, their bank accounts, their family, and the list goes on. But it's one thing in common. Every one of them are parts of things that belong on this earth. They're part of a world that we'll believe behind when we die. And the Bible warns us about giving the things of the world control over our lives. First John 2 and 15, first John 2 and 15, don't love the world, nor the things in the world. If a man loves the world, then the love of the father is not in him. As a Christian, my focus is not supposed to be primarily on things that I can acquire. Supposed to be Jesus. It's supposed to be other people. I'm not supposed to be primarily focused on the things of my life and what I can acquire. When I accepted Christ as my savior, I died to self, my own personal pleasures, or at least I was supposed to. We need to set our minds on things above, not just on things on the earth. Instead of wasting time frothing at the mouth with what our neighbor has. We need to realize there can be green grass on your side of the fence, too. A couple of questions this morning. You think to yourself, if, if God gives you what you're panting after, how is that thing going to help you? advance the kingdom of God? How is it going to affect your relationship with God right now? How can I use what God has already given me? Have I even used it? Have I even looked at it? Have I even tried to put it together? Some of the things that God has given us, they're still in the box. We ain't even opened it up. And we're still asking for some more stuff. You see, God doesn't like us coveting because it, it puts a barrier between me and my neighbor. You see, since my neighbor's grass looks greener than mine, he, he, he has something I want. So that puts a spirit of competition between me and my neighbor. To a certain extent, my neighbor becomes my enemy because they're standing in the way of me getting what I want. What is my attitude supposed to be toward my neighbor? Well, the Pauline letter to the Romans, chapter 13, says that we are to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. My attitude towards my neighbor should be love. You know, it's kind of hard. To love someone standing in the way of what I want. What I really think I need in order to find happiness. You see, love is characterized by self-sacrifice, not by self-gratification. Love rejoices when, 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 when those who, um, you know, when those who weep, weep, love weeps with them. When somebody else rejoices, if I love them, I rejoice right along with them. You see, a covetous spirit get envious when the neighbor new car shows up. When the furniture truck shows up. When they just want to share with you because they love you about God blessing them with a raise at work. A covetous spirit starts to laugh inside when that car gets hit in total. You see, it puts a spirit of competition between us. In comparison instead of cooperation. We cannot live abundantly thinking of our neighbor as an enemy. But a loving spirit allows me to be glad. When someone else is able to purchase a car, and my car is still old, but it's still running. I'm praising God when, 
when my neighbor is promoted to manager, know what? I may need a job one day. <laughs> Did you know churches could be covetous too? Mm. It's very easy when things aren't exactly like we would like them in our church. We look at the, cro- the church across the street and we say, if we just had a choir like that, if we just had musicians like that, boy, if our pastor was like that, if we had tithers like that, look what they driving in the parking lot. Whatever else. And the more we think like that, the church across the street becomes the enemy. And when we have an attitude like this, guess what starts? Exaggerations and speculations. They must be doing something wrong over there. (laughs) Have all that stuff. You know what? They got that stuff because they watering down the gospel. Everybody over there going to hell in their cars. People just want to go there because they just want to be seen. You know, that's the new club church. Not the proper attitude for a church. Whatever it is that we want for this church, we don't get it by bashing another church just because they already have it. Like, well, we, have we asked God for it? Are you going to be part of the solution that goes out and get people who aren't a part of the kingdom Have them come in and help us to achieve the goals God has for this church. Why did it get quiet there? You see, we need to thank God for what he's blessed us with and continue to lift up the name of Jesus and let God give the increase as he continues to do. You see, God forbids coveting because it's motivation To just break all the other commandments. Because as I said before, it's a heart condition. Plainly as I can put it, covetousness produces sin. Think about it this way. Where does stealing arise from? We steal when we want something somebody else has had. Adultery has its roots in coveting. It, it, It happens when you desire a sex partner who's not your own. If I'm not satisfied with the requirements that God places on me or that he blesses and then then he gives, then you know what? I'm going to put another God in his place. If I covet my neighbor's style of living and I know that I can't get there on my nine to five, five days a week, then guess what? Second job and I'm working seven days a week. If I'm not willing to get it through honest means then I'll just steal it from my neighbor. And he may stand in the way if I do that, so I may be required to kill them for it. Our covetousness is causing us to look for abundant living in all of the wrong places. We fill ourselves with, with more and more stuff only to find it empty. Maybe it's just me. You ever wanted something so bad that, that you almost have to wipe your mouth? Like, God, oh, I got to get that thing. And then you get it, and you're like, is that, was, uh, what, did I, I, lost, I lost sleep over that? I'm just trying to help this morning. We erroneously think the accumulation is the solution for our misery. 
but then we come, become more dissatisfied. Luke 12 and 15, hear these words. Then he says to them, watch out. Be on guard against all kinds of greed. The King James Version says covetousness. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. This verse alone should alter the way we think and live if we truly believe this verse. If getting is not the way to experience real life, then what is? Well, Matthew 25, Matthew 25 speaks, Jesus speaks in a parable about servants. And in Matthew 25, he says that the servant who is faithful over a few things, I'll make you ruler over many. See, we have to remove this idea of wanting everything to be just given to us with no work. No sacrifice. We keep trying um, to step over today to get to tomorrow. When the lesson of today is that you need to step a little bit to the side because there's a hole tomorrow. And we step right in the hole because we ain't focused on today. Be faithful to today because it prepares you for tomorrow. Follow me here. Faithful, a few things rule over many. See, we want to be the boss, but we've not learned our job well enough in order to lead someone that's doing what we have failed to understand what to do. So how effective of a boss will we be? You, you want to take away from today? Take this away. When looking at things of the world, you got to be careful of developing what I call honeymoon eyes. Honeymoon eyes. Where we want the honeymoon, but we've not prepared for or sacrificed or desire the marriage. Some say, man, I want to be a pastor. And I say, my child, you have honeymoon eyes. You just see what's going on up here on Sunday. See, because you don't even come to church and Bible study on a regular basis. When the request for prayer goes out, you're looking around like you forgot to do your homework. You have honeymoon eyes. When... You say, I want a car like that. And I say, beloved, you, you riding six months on temp tags for a car you bought in January. You got honeymoon eyes. You sit there and say, you know what? I want to be a millionaire. And I said, you're not even putting in the work to be a good hundred heir. You, you, you think God is going to all of a sudden give you a million dollars. Now you're coming up with a budget. Now you're going to focus on financial stewardship. You got honeymoon eyes. See, you want the perks of marriage. But you don't want to make the sacrifice for marriage. You see, you got honeymoon eyes when you look at somebody and you say, Ooh, I want to have sex with them. <laughs> but see, you're not signing up for the moodiness, occasional sickness. Days when everything won't be lovely. Days when the picture of what you see has now changed. Because trust me, she don't wake up like that. <laughs> see, you, you desire the body. 
but you don't want to connect with the spirit. So be careful of honeymoon eyes. I could stop there, but I'll go on. So we ask ourselves, why, why should God give us more to change our lot in life if we're not thankful for what he's given us? Look around at what God is giving you. Look in the mirror at what he's giving you. Look back on your life and where he's brought you. See, you, you, you may have pain in your legs, but thank God you can feel your legs. Your job may not be glamorous in your eyes, but God has made a way to keep a roof over your head. You may not have the finest car, but what God has provided is a way for you to get to A to B back to A. You may not have the finest clothes, but God has made it a way so you don't have to wash on Wednesday what you wore on Monday and Tuesday just to have something to wear on Thursday and Friday. You may not be eating the finest cuisine, but praise God, you've not missed a meal yet. You may not be in perfect health, but your health is obviously better than the person that did not wake up this morning. What God has for me is for me, and if it's not, I don't want it. God did not give you a desert on your side of the fence. God has not made it such that nothing will grow on your side of the fence. God gave you grass. What are you doing with it? The grass can be even greener on your side of the fence. Or maybe God just has to bring you to a point where he takes away the stuff that he's given in order for us to realize, do, do we have to be stripped down to nothing to appreciate the something that's already there? I just want to end with a few questions and points. What or who leads your life? What or who motivates your life? If God told you right now to sell your dream home that you spent so long waiting for, pack up your family and move to a one-room hut in Africa that he'd reserved for you, would you do it? Okay, let's not be that drastic. Didn't get no bites there, so. <laughs> what if he just says, hey, sell one of your cars. Give the proceeds to ministry or just give one of your cars away. Mm. What if he prompted you to change careers just so that you could save your family? What if he said, you know, just, just, just give up some of this TV time or the hobby or the sport or whatever activity to serve him in a greater capacity in ministry. What if he merely just said this? Could, could you turn in a little bit earlier on Saturday night to get up two to three hours after you would wake up for work just to make it here on time? Where's our hearts? Is it set on things of this earth? Or is it set on God? So let us begin to control the urge to be covetous. The Bible tells us to give thanks in all things. Let us go after gratitude. What is the best weapon against a covetous spirit is one of gratitude. Thank you, God. 
rejoicing in what we already have. Stop stressing about what you don't have. Let me tell you, I don't, I don't have to covet any longer. Don't let me sit up here like I wasn't that person. Oh, I was that person. Like, I'm going to get that and more and more and more. The Lord made me promises to be an obedient child that he would give me the desires of my heart. And he's been faithful to that. Yeah, I may not have what my neighbor has, but you know what? I may not be ready for that yet. Mm. I, I may not be ready for that ever. I don't have to cover the promotion. I seek the Lord and let him promote me. If I need a financial blessing, I don't call upon the lottery. I call upon the Lord. If we possess Christ, we lack nothing. Until we learn to be content with what God has blessed us with, we will always see the grass on the other side of the fence as greener because we spend so much time looking at it. But when you look around at all the blessings God has graciously poured out of heaven upon us, we can be content, more than content, mm. appreciative, grateful. Then we will be able to understand what abundant life really is means. That's the lesson we need to learn today. I'll end with a story, personal story of mine. In my professional career, I always wanted to be at the top, went to school, got the master's degree, doing all these things and, 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 and wanting that, that promotion, that title, that's all I was after. I just, I couldn't even sleep at night because I wanted and prepared myself for it, continue to be passed over. It's not the right time. And, and I just found myself just, just angry all of the time until I just let it go and say, you know what? Because here's the, here's the crazy part about it. So I wanted this title. Right. But I'm making the same money that the title came with just didn't have a title. And I'm still not satisfied. I want that title. Is this so I can walk around like forget the money. I got active in in Bible study and the Lord starts speaking to me and say, you know what? This title doesn't define me. I give it up. I don't need that. I don't want that. I'm just following the Lord. Two, two, here we go. Hold on. Two weeks later, after I made that decision, I get a call. Cedric, this project just opened up and we're slotting you for that manager's position with a $10,000 increase. I say that to say, you know, I don't just sit up here just talking. I've lived through this stuff. When, when, when you follow the Lord and say, well, the things of the world don't define me. Then God can bless you with that abundance. Because guess what? Now, I wasn't walking around like I'm the boss. I accepted the position with humility because it didn't define me. And... And, and, and two years later, God called me to the ministry and said, you got to quit. But that's a whole nother story. <laughs> but I hope you receive what's been said today. I hope you've received what's been said over the past 10 weeks. These have been some foundational <laughs> sermons here. <laughs>